welcome. I'm Professor Adam Thompson, and we have a, another interesting ECG case. In this case, we have a 67-year-old male that was playing golf, and uh, during his backswing, before he even swung at the golf ball, he began uh, feeling some dizziness and some sweatiness, and he started having some very atypical chest pain. You know, it was more sharp and stabbing-like, not your typical squeezing pressure, but it was sharp stabbing, like, you know, somebody was sticking him in the chest with a knife, and then he started saying he was having, you know, like a twinging or, or, or a, a spasm in his chest. He had no pertinent medical history. He didn't take any medications for anything. Otherwise, he's got a, you know, pretty clean bill of health. He goes out golfing every weekend, and usually he doesn't get this feeling. So, uh, he, you know, the, the dizziness and the sweatiness uh, was really concerning him. His friends called 911. So after EMS got there, the paramedic noticed the patient's diaphoretic and, and pale. And anytime you see unexplained diaphoresis or pallor, you, you know, you should consider that an angina equivalent. All right, that's an ominous finding. But this guy's outside and it's Florida. So, uh, you know, that could be, you know, a good explanation of why he's sweaty. Um, so we don't necessarily know, you know, a lot of people get heat exhaustion, especially in Florida. It could just be that. He could just be a little dehydrated. He's got no obvious dyspnea. His, his respirations are about 16 per minute. And then they take his blood pressure, and they notice that's pretty low, about 100 over palp. His blood pressure is 100 over palp, and his pulse is 86. Now, the first thing I, you know, I do when I notice somebody's got hypotension um, is look at the heart rate. And the heart rate should be accelerated, right? They should be compensating. If it's not, if they have a normal or bradycardic heart rate, then I start wondering if there's, you know, a medication on board, like a, a beta blocker or calcium channel blocker, or something that would cause them to have a decrease in heart rate or the inability to uh, compensate for that hypotension. Um, in this case, the guy doesn't take any medications. So the fact that he's got a decreased heart rate with a decreased blood pressure uh, should, you know, really concern you. His Glasgow's 15, he's, you know, compass menace, answering questions appropriately, alert and oriented. He tells you the pain's about an 8 out of 10, and it's a sharp, stabbing pain, you know, kind of in the center of his chest. So the EMS crew is pretty quick to get a 12-lead EKG, and uh, here's that 12-lead that they got. And, you know, outside of the wandering baseline, there's not a lot just really sticking out. Uh, you, you got, a, you know, what looks to be a sinus rhythm. However, you know, the uh, P waves might be a little negative in lead three, so you could be, you know, looking at an ectopic atrial rhythm, but n nothing is really crazy about it, right? If this, you know, heart rate was a little bit faster, it would make a little bit more sense, but other than that, uh, there's nothing really standing out about this EKG. You got a normal axis, normal precordial axis, it's a narrow, complex, supraventricular rhythm, um, you know, nothing to write home about here. So, of course, we're going to get serial 12 lead EKGs. I always hear Dr. Dr. Amo Matu say uh, one EKG begets another, uh, and, and that's a saying that I think he got from Corey Slovis, and it makes a lot of sense. We always do trends. When it comes to vital signs, one set of vital signs is useless, right? When it comes to EKGs, one EKG you know, could be useless as far as saying somebody's got a clean bill of health. Get several EKGs you know, and get them with every set of vitals. Make this another one of your vital signs. And here's the next EKG, six minutes after that first one. And hopefully the changes are standing, you know, out for you. And you can see them pretty obviously. Uh, th there's obvious ST segment elevation on this 12 lead EKG. Whenever you see ST segment elevation, you should go through your differential of causes of ST elevation. However, if you see the ST segment elevation develop right in front of you on a patient with chest pain, you should probably consider this to be a STEMI. If the EKG is dynamic right in front of you and the patient's got diaphoresis, got chest pain, if they've got dyspnea, any of those things, you should think that's probably cardiac until proven otherwise. So for the heck of it, we're going to go ahead and look at our differential for ST segment elevation. So first we have electrolytes. You know, the, the rhythm looks pretty narrow. The T waves don't look peaked. We've got no reason to suspect uh, an electrolyte abnormality. So that's going to be crossed out. That's not what's happening here. Left bundle branch block, again, we have a narrow QRS complex. So this is not an intraventricular conduction delay like a bundle branch block. 
early, early repolarization. That's a possibility, right? We do see the ST segment elevation in several of the leads, uh, which is indicative of, you know, your early repol or your pericarditis. And it's concave. You do see a concave upward, you know, ST segment elevation, you know, here, here, here. Um, and, and you might even call that a notch J point in lead two. You, you could call it that. However, um, this is dynamic. This happened right in front of you. This is not early repolarization. On top of that, when you see this amount of SC segment elevation, you should probably not think early repol. When you have a 12-week go from this to this, right in front of you with a chest pain patient, again, you got to think MI first. But going back to our differential, we're going to cross out that early repol. Ventricular hypertrophy, again, look at your 12 lead. It's not, you know, you don't have a whole lot of high voltage or anything like that. That's not a strain pattern. That's not the cause of it. Ventricular aneurysm, no, we watched it happen right in front of us. It's not a ventricular aneurysm. Treatment, we're not doing anything like a pericardiocentesis, so it's not that. Injury, that's our AMI, our acute myocardial infarction. We're going to leave that on there. Osborne waves, if you don't know what an Osborne wave is, it's that, you know, J wave that can occur right after the QRS complex, usually caused by hypothermia. Probably not the case here in uh, Florida while he's playing golf in the middle of the summer. So we're going to cross out Osborne waves. The non-occlusive vasospasm, um, you know, that's a possibility. However, this guy, you know, he, he's not on any stimulants, and he was playing golf. You know, it's not uh, really a good cause of a non-occlusive vasospasm. However, uh, physical exertion with maybe uh, some undiagnosed coronary artery disease could be a cause of myocardial injury. So we're going to obviously lean towards the injury over that uh, Prince Metals angina. And then looking again at this dynamic change, looking at the first EKG and the one that was six minutes later, I mean, it's very, uh, it's a very good case of why or a good reason why we do serial 12 leads. Just six minutes, you could have significant changes. And there's no real indication on this first one. You don't see Wellens T waves. You don't see the DeWinter T waves. The only thing you really see is bradycardia. You know, the patient's bradycardic in the presence of hypotension. This might have been somebody that you were considering to treat for symptomatic bradycardia, you know. Start with fluids, oxygen, uh, atropine. That might have been the, the route you were going to take until this next 12 week came up and uh, kind of gave you the reason that they were having these uh, cardiac symptoms. So the patient made it to the hospital and, and, and got on the cath table. And here's the angiogram. So let's look at this first one. All right, so you kind of see where blood flow stops right about here. There's a little bit of that stenosis, okay? Um, I say a little bit. There's a lot of stenosis there. That's, that's a really bad occlusion. And if you compare it to the angiogram after reperfusion, look at that difference. Obviously, there's a whole vessel missing here that's not being perfused. So that's a, a really bad LED occlusion, okay? The LED is the left anterior descending coronary artery also known as the Widowmaker, because it can cause sudden cardiac arrest. I have no doubt that this patient, if he didn't receive good pre-hospital care and uh, reperfusion in the, in the cath lab, he would have been one of those cardiac arrest patients. So we had a great outcome here, saved a lot of myocardium and uh, quality of life once again.